Good afternoon. Welcome everyone to the first real Pologne. First one in person after such a long time. Good, it feels good to be back in this room. Um, it's a great, great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Roger Davis of Oxford. Uh, Roger did his undergraduate studies at the University College London and his PhD in 79 from Cambridge University. After that, he was a staff member at Kitt Peak National Observatory in Arizona, where he uh, even acquired tenure, but that did not seduce him to stay in Kitt Peak, of course. Um, he returned to Oxford uh, as a lecturer, and soon thereafter, uh, they recognized his abilities and invited him to Durham as a full professor and head of astronomy. Um, he stayed there for eight years, and after that, he returned to Oxford, now as a Philip Wetton Professor of Astrophysics. And it's very interesting, but there are only two chaired professors in astrophysics at Oxford, Roger and one more, and one more. Uh, the whole astrophysics was only two chaired professors, just to see how the British system works. Um, he uh, has been head of the physics department at Oxford, two times uh, for two periods, heads of, head of astrophysics. And uh, since 2014, he's the director of the Hidge Center for Astrophysical Surveys. That is there also. Um, a multi million pound operation. He also has received many uh, grants, again, several million each. So he's doing well uh, in terms of funding for this review. He is currently the president of the European Astronomical Society. And next week, the Council of the European Astronomical Society has its meeting here in Iraqia. So because of that, uh, we got to the uh, um, In the past, he was president of the Royal Astronomical Society in the UK. Uh, he's a member of Academia Europea and has a list of awards which I will not mention. They're all uh, interesting. I will only mention the last one, which is not in the internet, and that's the Fred Royal Prize from the Institute of Physics in London. So, very glad to have you here, Roger. Thank you very much, Nick. It's wonderful to be here. And I, I didn't know until I got here that I was the first in person speaker. So I'm happy to share with you. This is my first trip. <laughs> I've, been, I've been anchored in Oxford since February 2020. So it's wonderful that uh, we're able to get back together and have in person interactions. And I'm really pleased to be here. It's, it's a great honor. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you today uh, about galaxy evolution, and I shall do so um, in, in uh, the beginning, pretty general terms, outlining how the subject has developed and what, we, what tools we use and how it works. And I would hope to get across to you that we are approaching a point where we can do much more quantitative physics style tests, for example, about galaxy evolution uh, than we have done in the past. So the, the, the talk is, is based like this. Uh, I'll give some background. I'll talk about one particularly particular survey in which I was directly involved, the SAMI survey. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that instrument and why that's important. I'll talk about the fundamental plane, and that's the bulk of the talk. Um, I, I'll also then compare the results from the SAMI survey on the fundamental plane with another survey which is called Legacy, um, which allows us to look at the variation of galaxies properties as a function of redshift. And then I'll wrap up uh, with some also some caveats. <laughs> well, I can't, I, I can do no other. <laughs> yes, of course I will. Yeah. So look, um, I'm going to show you a, a simulation, uh, the type of which you'd have seen a lot, I'm sure. This is a cosmological simulation by my colleagues in the Horizon AGM group. Um, and the, um, the purpose of showing this is just to 
remind you that galaxy evolution takes place in the context of an expanding universe and, and, and the large scale structure that arises from small perturbations um, in, in, a, in a cosmological model that uses the standard uh, parameters uh, based on mostly on the, on the cosmic microwave background. There are some things about this whole style of simulations which don't quite work. Uh, and, and so I shall, I shall say a little bit more about that towards the end. And I'll actually say something just in a moment when I've shown it. So let me do this. So uh, this is the Horizon AGN collaboration. And the color coding here is that, so here is a huge part of the universe. This is a hundred megaparsec cube. And you can see here, uh, this is the evolution over time. The redshift is down here in the bottom right hand corner. So we've just gone below one, look, it's here. Uh, half now, nearly. And you can see what happens is that as time passes, the gas falls into the potential wells, heats up, and you, you can't see it too well. Actually, let's pause there. Let's pause there, and we'll start again so you can watch that again. Um, uh, the, the, the gas heats up, uh, and, produce, and, and stars form, and so on, and supernovae go off, and the heavy metal content of the gas goes up, and so you start to see more blue. So uh, this is rather coarse, uh, it's, it, it, of course, in the sense of not, there's not much detail here, and this is a huge chunk of the universe. So that bar, 10 megaparsecs, is just slightly less than the distance between here and the Virgo cluster. So, so it's a huge chunk of the universe, but you can see there are vast density variations as well as temperature uh, variations. Now, the second part is a, um, a blow up of uh, a, a, a smaller, uh, volume, about eight megaparsecs across. And now you'll see what happens now. Uh, this shows the bar has now reached just one megaparsec in size. Uh, and we're almost at redshift zero, redshift point one now. So this is the one megaparsec is around the size of the local group, right? So this doesn't look like the local group, right? The local group has two big galaxies, one middle-sized galaxy, a couple of small galaxies, and lots of dwarfs, right? So this is a good, um, a good illustration uh, of the uh, too many satellites problem. There are too many galaxies here uh, compared to real life. And so either most of these halos that we're seeing are never form stars and are just dark, or something else is happening. So that's one of the well-established long-term challenges that all these simulations face. Red is the uh, temperature of the gas, T. That's, sorry, uh, yeah, yeah. It, it, so, and the temperature of the gas goes from about 10 to the 4 Kelvin to 10 to the 8 Kelvin. So this is all ionized and up to X-ray emitting. Okay, so now let's get on to some of the things that we have bolted down well. So the first one is the luminosity function. That is how many galaxies of a certain mass form in each mass bin. And there's a whole range of observational surveys shown here. And you can see there's pretty good agreement between them. And they fit to this function, which is known as a Schechter function. And if you look at this functional form, basically it's an exponential decay at high values of M and a, and, and a power law of, 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 uh, of power alpha at uh, low values of M. And so that's what is seen here. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a power law at, at, at uh, low values of M and then this exponential cutoff. And this is well established and uh, the values for alpha uh, and M star are also well established. Now, this, when you look at the simulations and this is a generic, uh, statement about all the simulations, uh, the, the, the masses in the dark halos, if you just look at the dark halo masses and look at their mass distribution, that doesn't fit the luminosity function that I just showed you. So what, this is the same luminosity function that I just showed you. And the blue line in this, in this figure is the, are the observations. The simulations will give you uh, the red line. And uh, we, we have now a pretty good understanding of how um, the, 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 the mass distribution of galaxies that we see and the mass distribution of halos predicted by the, the simplest simulations, right? Just the ones that take the CDM uh, initial conditions from the, from the microwave background and, um, uh, and gravity. They give you too many halos at low mass and too many halos at high mass. 
and we believe that what's happening here is that, uh, well, of course, what we see in the galaxy luminosity function is the distribution of starlight in the galaxies, and star formation is quenched at high values uh, of mass in massive galaxies by the effects of uh, an active galactic nucleus in the center, and at low mass by the effects of supernovae, both of which disrupt the interstellar medium in the galaxy and quench star formation. I'll say more about that in a moment. Okay, so now let's look at some of the things, some of the challenges we have to think about in terms of explaining um, how, how galaxies form. So here, uh, one of the most uh, straightforward properties of galaxies in many ways is whether they are spiral or elliptical, right? So here, now you don't see those words on this slide, and that's one of the insights uh, which tells you a lot already, right? So star forming galaxies are, are nearly all in flat disks, spirals, and quiescent galaxies, some are in flat disks, some are flat disks, but others are strongly three-dimensional structures, a bit like a potato or a kiwi fruit, right? So they're not, they're not oblate or prolate, but they're triaxial. And so you can see straight away here that the structure of the galaxies is somehow connected to its star formation history, right? So that's something we have to kind of get a grip on. Why is that the case? And here's, I, I just put this in to remind you, this is the Hubble, the, the Hubble classification scheme. So of course, Hubble put the, uh, made this tuning fork diagram. Uh, I will only consider it to be a left-right diagram, so I won't make any distinction between the barred spirals and the non-barred spirals. They're just star-forming galaxies in my parlance. On the left-hand side, those galaxies, so-called elliptical galaxies, red and dead galaxies, no longer forming stars. He got the whole thing backwards. He thought that the, the, and that's why he called the left-hand side early type galaxies, because he believed that's what you started with. And then somehow you, these galaxies got spun up to make the right-hand side, which we now believe is totally backwards. We now believe that it, we start off with star forming disks and move into, in fact, one of the big questions is how do we move towards quenched galaxies, galaxies that are no longer forming stars? So before I go any further, I should say that this talk is really about the most massive galaxies. So going back to that luminosity function, say the first decade of mass, or perhaps decade and a half of mass. Once you get down below that, a lot more physical effects enter and, and things get a bit more complicated. Okay, so here's another property that depends on whether galaxies are star forming or not, on whether they're spiral or early type. And this is to do with where you find them, their environment, right? So this is a very famous plot. It's now a bit out of date, but I like to use it because um, it was the first uh, attempt, or per first uh, uh, paper that showed this. Um, so <clears throat> this is a, a plot of the fraction of, of, of a galaxy population against the projected density uh, of galaxies on the sky. And it, there are three curves. The upper curve on the left-hand side that starts, so now I do need to use my, here we are. This curve is the curve for spiral galaxies. So spiral galaxies are abundant at low densities and rare at high densities in clusters. Elliptical galaxies are rare at low densities and common in high densities. And S0 galaxies, so these are the non-star forming galaxies that have disks, they, they become more common uh, at, at very high densities. And this was a study of 55 clusters of galaxies. So these are all galaxies in clusters, 6,000 galaxies. It was a major piece of work in 1980. Okay, so that tells us also, so we've got a number of linked parameters now, right? We've got the, whether the stars are forming, whether galaxies are forming stars, what their structure is, and where they're found. Okay, so here's the first set of um, scaling relations that I wanted to show you. And the left-hand uh, um, diagram is from the um, uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey. Oh, dear, I, I, I've lost the last two numbers of 20 something, it must be 2008 or something, I think. Um, so this shows that what the color magnitude diagram. Now the color magnitude diagram is a very old uh, diagnostic for galaxies. And for a lot of the time, it only had what you see here is the red sequence on it. So this is, so here's the 
It, this is the color plotted here against, well, this is stellar mass here um, converted from, from the colors. And, and so the red galaxies are up here. So this sequence of galaxies here, these are the quiescent early type elliptical galaxies that you find in clusters. And these galaxies down here are the so-called blue cloud. Uh, these are star forming galaxies. And you can see in both cases, the more massive a galaxy gets, the redder it gets. And this is an important thing for, this has been a, a, a uh, uh, empirical fact that's been noted for a long time. And sometime around the 1990s, we began to realize that this is something to do uh, with uh, uh, the, the, the metal content of these big galaxies. So uh, are these galaxies, there are two ways in which you could make these uh, quiescent galaxies become redder as they get more massive. One is if the stars get older in the more massive galaxies, and the other is if that they get more heavy elements, more, more metal rich in more massive galaxies. And the answer turns out to be the latter. Now, I'm gonna move now to the right-hand side to talk about the blue cloud, because this actually is the same diagram, actually. It's just that the y-axis has been turned on its head, right? So now we've got a plot here. This is obviously a hand sketch of the number of existing stars. So that's the stellar mass essentially against the number of stars that are forming. So of course, if you have a lot of stars forming, you're gonna have blue colors. And if you don't have many stars forming, you're gonna have red colors. So this diagram is just the, the, uh, the other way around of, of this one. But, but I wanted to show it because just from the point of view of getting the nomenclature straight. So this sequence of, uh, of star forming galaxies where the, 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 the star formation rate is proportional to the mass is known as the main sequence for, um, for star forming galaxies. There are a few galaxies, a factor of 10 higher than that, that we call starbursts, which I won't mention again, and a few galaxies a little bit more than a factor of 10 fainter than that, which are the early type red and dead galaxies. One thing that's a little puzzling here is the relative numbers. For some reason, this, this diagram, schematic diagram, has very few red and dead galaxies, whereas here you can see there's a lot of galaxies up here. This is the one that's a true volume uh, limited sample. Okay, so here's my, uh, I guess this, the first time I'm gonna talk about the fundamental plane, which is basically the structure of this talk. And uh, I'm sorry, you can't see it, but it, it, what it says up there uh, is, um, uh, well, I'm not quite sure what it does say actually, but anyway, it's the, it's the, it, it's a, the fundamental plane is the, um, the, the scaling relationship which relates the structure and dynamics of these galaxies. Okay, and, and this is quite an interesting little bit of uh, history which Nick already mentioned. So uh, in, the, uh, in, in the late 80s, uh, I was uh, in America, as, as Nick said, and a group of us started, started working on this around 1979, 1980. We discovered this connection between the, the velocity dispersion of the stars in early type galaxies. So that's the random motions of the stars. That's what keeps them up. They don't rotate much. The size and, uh, the, and, and the luminosity of these galaxies. And we were interested in using this relationship to measure distances. So we formulated this relationship like this. We, we, we wrote down an equation for the radius in terms of the velocity dispersion and something that we called IE, which is the surface brightness. So IE is the luminosity inside, uh, the E refers to the effective radius. So that's a uh, radius that contains half the light. So it's just a metric radius, if you want to think of it that way. It's a surface brightness. It's a basically I divided by R squared. Now, a surface brightness and a velocity dispersion are both distance independent and, and can be measured. With a, with, a, uh, with a telescope. The left-hand side, you don't know, right? You don't know how big a galaxy is in kiloparsecs, uh, e e even if you know it's redshift, because there are, because you know, you know it's redshift, but they, these galaxies are nearby. This is a nearby sample of galaxies, maybe going out to 40 megaparsecs or something like that. Their peculiar motions are significant. So you, this is, a, this is a, a redshift independent way of determining the distances to galaxies. And in particular, it's one that works very well 
with early type galaxies because early type galaxies, are, as I've shown you, are found in clusters. So you don't just have to use one galaxy, you can use a dozen galaxies. And so then what you can do is measure this uh, combination here. And depending on the distance, you'll get relations that do this. So as, as they get further away, the R will get smaller, right? So, so then you can put them all back on and measure the distance in, in, in kiloparsecs. So we use this as a distance determinant. Once you have a distance determinant, you can say, OK, we know the value of the Hubble constant, <clears throat> which we didn't, of course, but never mind, we do now. Um, we know the value of the Hubble constant, so we know what the distance should be in terms of the expansion of the universe. We measure the actual distance in megaparsecs, and so we can tell the velocity, the peculiar velocity that this galaxy has over and above the Hubble expansion. And that allowed us to essentially measure masses on the largest scales and measure omega, right? So that was the project, which, which took a long time to do all that. Um, but th and this was the tool we used. Now, this is why this is formulated in this way. I just wanted to explain that because the rest of the talk, I'm going to formulate it in another way and I'll explain why when we get to that part. Uh, so I think I've covered everything here. Okay, now let's think about the properties of galaxies as a function of redshift. And I've put two up here and I'll summarize the others in I think the next slide. So the left-hand diagram shows the star formation rate as a function of redshift. Now this is a very famous piece of work. Madow and Dickinson played important roles at different stages, but this is the summary slide out of their annual reviews. And so you, what you can see here is that at redshift two, the star formation rate in galaxies is a factor of 10 higher than it is today. So something has caused star formation to decay, the star formation rate to decay. And that's one of the main kind of physical processes we need to get a handle on. And of course, as you might imagine, there are many physical processes that might contribute to that. The right-hand side of, of, the, of the slide shows you uh, the sizes of galaxies in kiloparsecs as a function of redshift. And the, the, the reason there are three, um, three curves is that the top one is for galaxies uh, of masses greater than 10 to the 11 solar masses. The middle one is between log of 10.5 and 11, and the lower one is below uh, 10.5. And in fact, there's a fourth one, actually, which doesn't decay like the others. So this is a talk about massive galaxies. So those three upper curves are the main ones. And you can see that by redshift two, galaxies have shrunk in size by factors of three, four, five. So um, galaxies were forming stars much more intensely, and they were very much smaller at redshift two than they are now. Okay, so I'm, I just want to summarize some more things. I don't want to go through all the evidence. Uh, so, ah, uh, yes. So one thing you have to watch out for here is I will often say through in this talk, this kind of galaxy is so much more star forming than that kind of galaxy. And I always mean at the same mass, right? I won't always say at the same mass, right? So I've written it here and underlined it at once. Compared to nearby galaxies at the fixed stellar mass, galaxies, let's say between 0.5 and 2, because there's a, a whole range of properties, they're more compact, I've shown you that. They're more highly star forming. Uh, but some results from ALMA and similar telescopes show us that they have more turbulent star forming gas and higher and they and they have a higher gas content so they have more gas to form stars from now this can hardly be too much of a surprise it would be astonishing if they had less gas right i mean they you know the, the, the evolution of the universe is a sense you know a process through which gas is turned into stars and then cycled and turned into more stars and cycle okay so just to look at the uh, the uh, lower panel of this of this slide uh, so the summary here is that a redshift of two, we have intense star formation underway in massive galaxies until something quenches it. Uh, what is that thing that quenches it? At lower redshifts, what we find is that as this, in this intense star formation occurs in less and less massive galaxies. So we call that downsizing. And what this means is that galaxies today, they have less gas available than their precursors. And they're, of course, in lower density environments because the universe is expanding. So these are two things that are unavoidable physical effects, which will affect the star formation history of galaxies. OK, now this slide is a cartoon. Um, 
this is just to emphasize how many different kinds of physical process are at work when we're looking at how galaxies form and evolve. So the brown circle uh, is uh, a dark halo. And let's go from the top in a clockwise direction. So th th there'll be some angular momentum associated with that dark halo that's simply generated from the tidal torques of the other dark halos around it. There'll be some gas in that dark halo, which is cooling and forming stars. So the, 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 the coal gas that forms stars, it, there'll be some younger stars and some older stars, some red star, some blue stars and some red stars. Occasionally, another galaxy uh, in its own halo will fall into this halo and merge with it. And when that happens, it's it, because if you think about the statistical mechanics of the disk, two disks, uh, they're going to they're, they're going to cause um, essentially chaos in the middle, right? They will produce something where the, there's a lot of objects that don't have much angular momentum, a lot of stars that don't have much angular momentum, and they will form a, what we now call a bulge, a central component, uh, and they'll distribute the other material throughout the dark halo. So that's the red, the red circle in the middle. As the stars form, they will distribute heavy elements into the uh, rest of the, 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 the galaxy, uh, and of course the supernovae go off some of that some of that material will even spread out into the intergalactic material uh, and and we call this feedback this is this is uh, uh, both gas and energy from a supernova explosion being injected into um into the intergalactic into the interstellar medium excuse me and there's one there's one thing here that is not included in the slide and that is the possibility that there might be an active nucleus at the center of this galaxy and if that were the case that would be another mechanism for feedback putting energy and uh, uh and particles uh, into in into the dark halo okay so there's a lot going on here so uh, at this point i just want to pause and give you the, the, our current ideas about how um, early, massive early type galaxies form. So we have now from the, all these pictures, all these bits of evidence put together, we, we've uh, come to a view that the way massive early type galaxies form is in a two phase process. The first phase is that a very high, well, uh, for this story, very high redshift, redshift two, uh, there's a period of very intense in situ star formation. Now, we, we have other reasons, you know, we have good reasons for thinking this, uh, which I won't go into because there's, you know, not enough time, but um, we, we know that the star formation can't have a very long duration. And that's because of the pattern of chemical elements that we see in, in the old stars or the old component. But, and we know, because we've seen that this early intense period of star formation uh, produces very compact galaxies. Uh, and the, 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 the gas content of these objects is high, the gas density is high, and for, for those of you who work on star forming galaxies, there's this Kennecott schmidt law where the uh, rate of star formation is proportional to gas density, and that's basically what you're seeing here, very high ga gas density, very high rates of star formation. So that's the first phase, like a starburst, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, and the second phase is after that, it, th there are a lot of minor mergers take place. So a lot of smaller bodies uh, will fall in. Those bodies will um, not generate a great deal of chaos in the major halo, um, but they will build up mass. Um, and every now and again, probably on average one, two or three per galaxy, major mergers will occur in the, in the period between redshift two and now. Okay, so that's the sort of background and the sort of where we got to. So let me tell you a bit about the SAMI survey and I'll rattle through this relatively quickly. Um, so uh, the data for the SAMI survey is there's an imaging survey published, which is known as the gamma survey. And, and uh, SAMI is the spectroscopic part of this survey. Um, so the, the images give us a luminosity, a size, a shape, that's ellipticity and a concentration which I'll refer to as N. I'll show you what that is in a moment. Now, the, the, the SAMI instrument, it stands for um, oh, Sydney um, Astrophysics Multi-IFU Instrument. I'll, I'll try and explain what that means in a moment. So um, uh, 
the SAMI is the spectroscope, is the instrument through which the survey was carried out. And the, the spectra that SAMI takes give us velocities, velocity dispersions, and the, the strengths of absorption light features, which is what we use to characterize the stellar population. So this talk is going to be about dynamics and stellar populations from now on. Um, right, let's think about IFU spectroscopy. Oh, let's just quickly do the gamma imaging. So here are a couple of examples of galaxies um, uh, taken with a CCD imaging camera. Um, we fit a two-dimensional, what we call SIRSEC model to this light. So if you look at this functional form, it's a very simple functional form, excuse me. Um, so here, uh, if, so this is just an exponential functional form if N is one. Right, so the light distribution of a spiral galaxy roughly goes like a, a, a negative exponential from the center to the outside. That describes the radial variation of light in the spiral galaxy. And in the, 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 in, in the 20 years ago, we would have described the light, the radial light distribution in an early type galaxy as going like <clears throat> uh, this law with n of four. Right, so this would be the so-called SIRSEC model. These days we fit a more, uh, we, we allow that uh, index of four to vary in the fit, but from all these fits, we get out a luminosity, a size, a shape, and this N value. And just to finally tell you what the N value is. So this shows you here, surface brightness in magnitude to square arc, second against radius, normalized to the half light radius. The blue is just the exponential decline that we see in spiral galaxies. And uh, with the increasing value of N takes you through things that are more and more centrally concentrated and then also have a, an outer halo. Um, okay, so now one thing we have to bear in mind here is that we're talking about galaxies. And as I showed you in that picture of galaxies, star forming galaxies and quiescent galaxies, these are extended objects. So if you, for example, just put a Sloan fiber on the middle of M31, say, right? Everybody knows what M31 looks like. Then, of course, the spectrum you get out looks exactly like a quiescent galaxy because there's no star formation going on in the center of M31. Uh, so, but that doesn't characterize M31 at all. We know M31's got a star forming disk. So, um, Typically, what we would have done and what we did do uh, in, in, for example, the Seven Samurai survey, the, the, the one to get the, um, oh, I didn't explain why it was called Seven Samurai, did I? No, no. Okay, so sorry. Uh, the survey that I referred to that measured the peculiar motions was dubbed the Seven Samurai survey by uh, Amos Yahil who, because it was a major result at the time, and he was impressed that it kind of cut through the cosmology of the day, which is now completely irrelevant, but the name of the survey, um, the name of the survey uh, sticks with it. Uh, the way we did that was just with aperture spectroscopy, right? So real primitive stuff. Uh, I was already at that time working with long slit spectroscopy, where you take the spectra uh, of a galaxy uh, uh, and use a long slit and characterize each point along the galaxy with a spectrum. But what I do now and what we've been doing with Sammy is to reformat the focal plane so that we look at the whole galaxy and we get spectrum at every point in the galaxy. Now you can see there's a big difference in what you get from this slide. So look at the, look at the long slit here. Here's the galaxy, right? Here's the long slit. Now, if you put that slit on there, you, you can clearly see that this galaxy is elongated this way, right? So if you put a slit on there, you wouldn't necessarily expect to find much in the way of rotation, but you do. So you can learn that. You can learn that from a long slit. And that's, that was an early result to do with the structure and dynamics of early type galaxies. Oops, excuse me. Ooh. There we are. Uh, but if you're able to take a spectrum at every point and measure the velocity at every point, in this particular galaxy, you see this remarkable structure, right? Now, I'm not going to say any more about this, but you can see that this technique allows you to measure and understand and model the complex structures within galaxies far more powerfully than either a long slit or a single aperture. What, what, what this is good for in this survey, however, the SAMI survey, is simply getting a representative chunk of the galaxy and getting a spectrum of a representative chunk of the galaxy, which, for example, you might put in the 
um, in, in the variables associated with the virial theorem. Now, that's one thing I didn't mention when I talked about the about the uh, fundamental plane, but you know, mass, radius, and velocity are the parameters in the virial theorem. And we know from gravity and statistical mechanics what the coefficients of those three variables should be. And I will come to that. Okay, so here, here I, I won't spend long on this, but this survey was done on the Anglo-Australian telescope. It, it was done with a multi IFU system. So I spent a lot of time in the 2000s and 2010s working with a single IFU, but this had 13 of them. They had 61 fibers. The survey was, the data taking was finished in 2018. And you can see the bottom part of this slide here, the, the three spiral galaxies. You see, here's a spiral galaxy here, but in the middle, it does have a bulge. So if you only put a, an aperture on that spiral galaxy, you'll end up with a much older population than if you were able to sample all the light with a, an array like this, for example. So it is important, particularly if you want to apply the virial theorem to have some kind of measurements that extend over a characteristic um, chunk of the galaxy. Here are, here are the spectra, here are some spectra. Uh, we, we used what, what are now, what's now a standard method, uh, PPXF, uh, my colleague, written by my colleague, Michaela Capillari, to measure the velocities, the velocity dispersion, uh, and, and, al and also the, the strengths of some absorption lines. Uh, you can see from this uh, graph here, these, these are the, the red is the spectra, the black is the percentage difference between the model and the spectra. You can see here that it spits out a velocity dispersion for various galaxies. So this goes from a very low velocity dispersion galaxy, which looks quite noisy, just because the lines are not very wide, uh, to an intermediate one, to a much smoother one. And the only difference between these, these are all roughly the same signal to noise, but the difference is that the, 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 um, the, the broad absorption lines of a high velocity dispersion galaxy smooth out the noise. And here's a nice little thing you can always do with these integral field spectrometers. You can, re you can reconstruct an image of the galaxy by simply adding up all the, all the wavelength channels. So actually, just to both, uh, there's quite a lot of radio astronomy goes on here, I think. So you might remember your H1 maps. This is exactly like H1 maps. You collapse them down and you can get an image. Um, OK, now, uh, so, so this, is, this slide now talks about stellar populations, and it doesn't say very much. It just says that we fit models to these 20 line indices to get age, metallicity, something called alpha on FE, which I won't use again. And from these uh, parameters, we can estimate the stellar mass to light ratio of Cylon star, right? So I'm afraid these two slides, this one and this one, are basically then magic happens and I get some numbers out, right? <laughs> I don't want to really go into how all that happens. There's a lot of technical detail there, but you know, just take it from me. These things are relatively standard procedures, not that they're flawless, but, but they're, you know, they're the, the, the normal way we do business. Okay, now the couple of early results from SAMI. Um, this is a, in a paper by Tanya Barone in 2018. And it shows the metallicity plotted against the log of the mass, the log of mass divided by radius and the log of mass divided by R squared. So M on R is the potential, right? And M on R squared is the mass surface density. So the, the purpose of showing you this is that the lowest scatter and the most sensitive relation comes uh, from metallicity has a tighter relation with potential than anything else. Okay, so this tells us, this is essentially confirmation that metallicity depends on the depth of the potential well, which is not too surprising. It, it, it depends on how the, the, the galaxy is able to hang on to uh, stellar ejector and even supernova ejector. Same, same uh, characteristic here now, but it's now age plotted on the y-axis against log m, log m on r, and log m on r squared. And again, the, the, best, the, the, the most um, significant relationship with the lowest scatter comes from the, the connection between age and mass surface density. Now, that's not quite so clear why that should be the case, but th these, these relations were established very early on. And they were sort of confirming 
you know, we weren't the only people who thought that this was the case. People had worked on this stuff, including me, um, uh, for quite a while. Okay, so the main paper I want to cover, and I'm, I can see I need to get on with it, um, is, is this paper by Francesco Di Eugenio, who was once upon a time my graduate student. Um, in fact, uh, yeah, this, in fact, so was my, my Nick, Nick Scott as well. And so this is the formulation of the fundamental plane um, in this new uh, way. So I've written it much more simply this time. So the previous version of the fundamental plane I showed you had R on both sides of the equation, log R on the left and brightness divided by R squared on the right. So this just tidies all that up. It says that the log luminosity should be a, a linear combination of the log of the velocity dispersion plus the log of the, uh, of the um, size, the, the effective radius, and here are the coefficients. Right now, this is L. Remember, so let's now let's go back now to the virial form. Okay, so uh, what can we learn from the fundamental plane? So consider a galaxy in its dark halo, then its virial mass, right, m ver, just goes like the velocity dispersion squared times the size, right? So uh, um, and, and where sigma sigma is just a, a velocity dispersion of a tracer population. So we've got the stars. The stars are there. We can use them. So we can just take logs on both sides and we can look at this. Um, and I've introduced this, this, um, this extra, extra term, kappa, where kappa describes perhaps the way in which the mass is distributed in the halo differently from galaxy to galaxy. So this may be an issue. The galaxies may not have entirely homologous mass distribution. So that's just to capture that possible level of uncertainty. But if, if you ignore that for now, then you, if you if you you should be able to fit um, uh, for, uh, the the virial mass and the velocity dispersion and the size uh, in a plane. Okay, so following on, what can we learn? Well, of course, we don't know the mass; we only see the light. So what we measure is the light. So let's make some assumptions. Let's assume. Let's make the assumption that the stellar to total mass ratio is f star, and the mass to light ratio. So that's how much how much light you get from each star, as it were, is a epsilon star. And so we can now convert that log m into a log l, and we end up with this slightly longer equation with a, a term in log epsilon, the mass to light ratio, and a term in log of the stellar uh, mass fraction. And so what we can use this now, we can fit, we can actually do this fit now, uh, and what this tells us, if we, what we, if we just fit to the sigma and r part, then what this tells us is uh, what, what we can look at the coefficients and it tells us how either the stellar mass fraction or the mass to light ratio or the non-homology parameter vary systematically as a function of sigma and r. And that might be quite interesting. Okay, so here's the first result, and this is the fundamental plane. Uh, so here, uh, what I've plotted now is up here. This is log L against uh, sig the, the, the uh, A log sigma plus B log R plus a constant, right? And so what you see here, here is the raw data, and here is a slightly smooth version of that, which makes it a little clearer that, uh, oh, and the color bar that you see on the right here is age. So you can see here that there's not much scatter around this relation. Um, the perpendicular scatter is about 0 0.048. Um, uh, but the, the values of A and B are not 2 and 1, which are the virial values, right? sigma squared plus RE, or times RE, um, but they're 1.3 and 0.9. Right, so, and, and there's a clear gradient uh, in this fit uh, uh, from, from galaxies that are on average a little more luminous than the fundamental plane would suggest to those that are not, with the more luminous ones being younger. And that, that, that age gradient is just a gradient in mass to light ratio. So for the younger stars, you get more light per unit mass, right? So, they, so that's, that's what causes this, this, um, this trend. So what drives this trend? Well, I've, I've more or less answered that already. So the first thing you can try is look for um, structural things. 
can you look at surface mass density, for example, the rotational support, the velocity divided by the velocity dispersion, the rotation velocity divided by the velocity dispersion, um, the central concentration N. The, the only one of these relations that shows more than a three sigma trend is with the structure parameter N, the SIRSIC parameter. Uh, it's not a very strong relationship. And you can see really here that N is just uh, galaxies that are, uh, are more massive here tend to have higher N. Uh, so there's, it, there's some of the scatter across the plane caused by this, but not much. It's mostly up and down the plane. What causes this are stellar population effects, namely uh, the age. So if you look in the top left here, that's a, a plot of the residual from that fundamental plane against age. So we already saw there's a gradient in age across that plane. Uh, and the bottom right is mass to light ratio uh, of those stars of that age. And there's an eight sigma correlation between the, between the residuals in L uh, and uh, either age or mass to light ratio. Uh, furthermore, we can look at mass surface density and, um, uh, and mass to light ratio. And, and what we find is there is a correlation between the mass to light ratio and the mass surface density here, which is given by this. And, uh, the, and, and you, what you find is that uh, higher mass to light ratio galaxies, which are older, right, have higher surface mass density. Right? So the older galaxies have higher surface mass density. So what this is telling you is that the older galaxies, sorry, the compact galaxies are older. They formed earlier. Okay, so uh, now, so... So, so we've got a problem now. So let me just pause for a moment here. I can't pause too long, but in the color magnitude diagram, for example, we can look at that. We can look at that, how it changes with redshift and so on. We can look at the star formation rate. We can look how that changes with redshift. But we have no means of knowing what color a galaxy should be. We don't have a, there's no absolute hook there. There's no physics behind that. It's just, let's measure it today. Let's measure it in the past. Let's compare it and try and understand what's going on. That's a good way forward, but it, it's a, entirely comparative. There's no absolute values here. Uh, with a fundamental plane, you've actually got the real theorem. You've got a piece of physics that tells you how these things should be related if you understand what's going on, which is a big if. But so this is what we're going to try and do now is to understand what causes the scatter and what I call the tilt of the fundamental plane um, uh, in this relation. And the tilt is just why is it that uh, the coefficient of sigma is 1.3, not 2, and the coefficient of um, R is uh, 0.8 and not 1. So, uh, and the way to do this is to fix, or at least one way to approach it, we know there's this gradient in, in age and mass to light ratio across the plane. So what we, what we first try and do is to remove all the effects of changes in the stellar population of different galaxies, make them all the same. So, of course, we've measured the mass to light ratio from the stellar population work that I just described in one slide, right? So instead of, instead of um, taking... Um, the, instead of taking the uh, luminosity to be the measured luminosity, we synthesize a luminosity, which is just the virial mass, uh, which we just take to be far of five sigma squared Re over G, right? So, so uh, and we divide that virial mass by a mass to light ratio. So we end up with light. So this is the light that we'd get if all the stellar population effects were removed. Right. And so in order to so this is to try and produce a fundamental plane that has the stellar population effects backed out. Now, in order to do this comparison, of course, we have to assume the other things that could be variable, like the dark matter, like the stellar fraction or dark matter fraction and the changes in homology to be not, not important. But, but anyway, you have to start somewhere uh, and we refit the fundamental plane. And this is what you get. So what you saw now, the, the, the top one you've seen before, that's what, you, that's what you saw before, that's the observed fundamental plane. And the bottom one is what you get when you've backed out the stellar population effects. And what you see is that the, the, um, the scatter uh, is only, um, the perpendicular scatter is only 0.048 uh, uh, in, in the fundamental plane to start with. And in the mock version of the fundamental plane, 
the, the, the scatter is 0.042. So you've, you've uh, accounted for a large fraction of the scatter in, this, um, in, in the star population um, variations. Uh, so it's about 75, but you have to you have to subtract these two things in quadrature, more or less. It's about 75% of the scatter arises because of variations in master-light ratio as a function of size and velocity dispersion. Um, now, the tilt is much more complicated, unfortunately. So uh, let's start with the good news. The good news is that in the mock fundamental plane, the tilt's 1.7 as opposed to 1.3, right? Which, so that's good. So you've accounted for some of the tilt in the fundamental plane towards the virial value by just taking account of the changes in mass to light ratio. The, on, on the, on the, uh, uh, the coefficient of R, however, goes the, uh, too far the other way. So it started off at 0.9 uh, and it ends up at 1.2. So, um, so we, we've taken account of about 60% of the tilt in the fundamental plane. Uh, but what, um, what needs to account for the rest of it is either the dark matter fraction or st stellar mass fraction, obviously one being the complement of the other, or something that I haven't yet mentioned, which is changes in the initial mass function. Now, in order to make the talk not too complicated at the beginning, I left out this completely, but clearly I've assumed all the way along that um, the, 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 the mass to light ratio of a galaxy is what it is, as it were, um, but it's quite likely we're beginning to realize that the initial mass function uh, uh, that stars have when they first form is not necessarily universal. And of course, that would change the mass to light ratios as well. Uh, and so it could be that that is, a, is another variable but, um, in here. So look, let's just wrap up this little bit because uh, I'm, how much longer have I got, Nick? 10 minutes, fine, okay, yeah. So um, the scatter is dominated by changes in age. There's this strong anti-correlation between mass to light ratio and surface mass density, which tells you that, that, that the compact galaxies form first. And when you take account of the stellar population effects, it, you, you account for some of the tilt, but not all of it, uh, and very much, uh, almost all of the scatter. And that tells you that the other variables that, that play a part, changes in the IMF, changes in the dark matter fraction, are probably anti-correlated because there's not much room for them to, to generate any more scatter. Okay, so the final thing I want to talk about, and this won't take that long, is um, changes it with redshift. So a second survey, this is called the legacy survey, and this is not something that I myself have done, but you'll see many of the authors are in common. And there's a, there are more authors below this band. Uh, legacy stands for Large Early Galaxy Astrophysics Census. It's a slit survey done with VIMOS on the VLT and using HST imaging. There are about 500 galaxies bracketed into two redshift ranges. Okay, so this is a little bit subtle, but the reason there are two redshift ranges which look rather similar, 0 0.6 to 0 0.68 and 0.68 to 0.76, is that I showed you that size evolution is quite quick. And so this is an attempt to freeze out a, wave, a, a redshift uh, band that has essentially no size evolution. There will be some size evolution between the two bands. It's massive galaxies, stellar mass is bigger than uh, log 10.5, um, uh, and they measure the size, they, they measure the mass, the size, the metallicity and the age. The, the spectra are very good signal to noise for this type of work at redshift half or greater. Uh, and what happens is that they do this work looking at um, the, the metallicity and the age across the mass size plane, because that you can't do the fundamental plane with these kinds of spectra, the velocity dispersions are not accurate enough. Okay, so what might we expect? So we've established now that the metallicity um, is, is fixed by the depth of potential well. Uh, that's the thing that uh, regulates the, the final metallicity and it's because of being able to retain heavy elements uh, from stars and supernova ejector in the galaxy rather than th them escaping from the galaxy. If that's the case, you should see a very similar thing 
at redshift 0.7. I mean, that can't change because after all, the, 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 the metallicity of the stars that have already formed are what they are. And they're that at 0.7 as well as at, at, uh, at redshift zero. Now, so here's the hypothesis that, that is tested in this paper. Let's think of compact galaxies. We know compact galaxies form stars earlier. And let's imagine that the star formation is quenched when that density of star formation reaches a critical surface density. And that surface density goes down as you approach the present day from redshift seven, at point seven. Right. So that's not an unreasonable hypothesis. The universe is expanding, density is falling. We know star formation in star formation rate goes like density. So it's it's a something to test. Um, so uh, at intermediate redshifts, then what that means is that the age surface density relation that I showed you at the beginning should be weaker or absent because there's a much smaller range of ages going into that relationship at redshift point seven. Okay, so here's the result. So this is the, the size mass plane now. So this is not the fundamental plane and it's in the three redshift bands. So the top one is the low redshift SAMI survey. And then the next two are the two uh, redshift around 0.7 bands of so middle one being the lower, the lower one being the uh, larger redshift. And we're looking at age and metallicity or metallicity and age left and right. So you see in metallicity, you still see a nice uh, relationship and uh, that is M goes like R, so that's constant potential. And that looks pretty similar. I mean, the, 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 um, the radii have gone down, obviously, because we've gone to redshift 0.7, but the slope looks perfectly reasonable. M goes like R. Uh, and actually, there's still even a, a, a reasonably regular uh, variation with age across that, across that relationship. Let's look at now the, 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 the mass, the same plane, the, the size mass relationship. Uh, and this time I'm going to show you um, constant surface, mass surface density. So that's like M goes like R squared. And that's like that. So you can see this is at the top, that's roughly what we saw before. Um, it is what we saw before. You can see if immediately you get down into the 0.7 region, the, the lower. Um, the middle panel here, um, things are getting confused. There's not a uh, there's not a, a good relationship between where points are and their age. And you can see by the time you get to the higher redshift band, that the the slope of that distribution of points is no longer um, uh, m, m goes to like r squared. So um, sorry, uh, so, sorry, uh, yeah, um, sorry. Surface density is constant. So yeah, that's right. Um, so you can see what's happened is that you've gone from a situation where things were pretty good, uh, the, the age, um, the, the, the uh, surface density, mass surface density is constant. Um, sorry, not constant. The mass surface density is setting the age to, to the, to the uh, case at higher redshift where the mass surface density uh, is now not well related to the age. Okay, so the results here are, so this is, uh, I've only got two or three slides to go now. The results are, uh, as I've repeated for Sammy, the metallicity, xenon H is determined by the potential and age is related to mass surface density. In the legacy survey uh, at the higher redshift, the mass size relationship confirms the metallicity potential uh, relationship is sustained. So there's no significant change in that process uh, over about six giga years. However, the connection between surface mass density and age is much weaker or absent. Uh, and what that's telling us is that the age mass surface density relation isn't fundamental, but it's built up over a period of time where the star formation truncated between point, redshift point 0.7 and today at a critical surface density, which is decreasing as you, as you go to the present day. So you get different ages at different times. And so what that, I think I'll skip through this, what, what this tells you here uh, is that, um, the, the, the current population, the local quiescent galaxy population, uh, uh, the galaxy surface density reflects the time when the star formation was quenched. So a quiescent population is quenched at a range of redshifts. Uh, and so that's why this is a much more sort of hybrid result rather than a clean result like the metallicity, um, the metallicity potential result. 
Okay, so the, the, the final conclusions here are uh, the one I've already mentioned about the metallicity being controlled by the potential and the escape velocity, the age accounting for most of the tilt, uh, most of the scatter in the fundamental plane and some of the tilt, but there's still tilt there. So there's still a role for either changes in the dark matter fraction or in the uh, initial mass function. More compact, more compact galaxies are forming earlier, and that's the relationship between mass to light ratio and surface mass density. And that the, that the age mass surface density relation at redshift zero results from generations of star forming galaxies being quenched at a critical mass surface density that decreases from redshift two to the present. Um, so now I want to make some just very brief general remarks now. What can you take from this talk? So scaling laws do provide insight into the physical processes that are working galaxy building. Uh, and they're moving from comparative studies into uh, a domain where you can actually make predictions and compare against physical models, such as the virial theorem, or even the escape velocity and metallicity relation, because you can build mass models for galaxies and look at the potential and look at as a function of radius, how the potential and the mass uh, and the metallicity are, are um, related. New, a lot of new surveys are underway. These are nearly all integral field spectrograph surveys uh, with much more detailed uh, observations, perhaps even including now the radial structure of galaxies. So instead of just using a virial chunk, actually looking at the, these properties as a function of radius. And new simulations are, 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 are being done all the time. These are increasingly sophisticated uh, and uh, there's certainly provide the possibility of detailed comparison with observations. There's a paper that was published exactly, or it appeared on Astro PH exactly a year ago today, uh, where, for example, they can reproduce the fundamental plane, but they don't really spend very much time to thinking about whether, you know, the, why they don't get the, the, the virial uh, uh, values of the coefficients. There are lots of caveats. Right, remember the caveats, so it's, it's very important. Um, the cosmological models parameterize all the subgrid physics, so the AGN feedback, the star formation, uh, and, and this limits their predictive power. They don't act, they, they don't, they, they describe these phenomena, but they don't actually, um, they don't, they're not really in a position to um, predict what, what they should see. And it's like a slightly smaller font, just because they reproduce a lot of the observational data doesn't mean that the, the physical processes of galaxy formation are understood. Um, that there are in the cosmological model some well-established uh, discrepancies between simulations and observations. The one I showed you at the beginning is that there, there are far more satellite objects in the simulations than there are in the real universe. The, the um, the, the mass profiles of, uh, of dwarf galaxies are much more cuspy uh, in the simulations than we see in real life. And we have far more galaxies that are just pure disks. It's very difficult to get a pure disk out of the simulations. Almost all galaxies end up with a bul bulge. There's also a lot of uncertainties in the stellar population modeling. We don't fully understand the physics of stellar interiors and stellar atmospheres. And of course, there are variations in the stellar evolution code, for example, they almost never take into account non-solar abundance patterns. So with that, I think I'll invite questions. Thank you. No, no, that, that's absolutely right. So, so for it, yeah. So, I mean, this is we don't know why this is, right? It, it's a, it, it's so. What I was really saying was that the results are consistent with such a model. 
you, you might think of um, other, uh, other mechanisms that would bring that about. I mean, the, the, um, the metallicity of the system will be increasing, for example. Um, so, so we don't really know. We just know that this seems to be what's happening, and it is consistent with a model where, where, the, um, where the critical density at which star formation is quenched falls uh, with, with inverse redshift, right? I, I think it's very exciting, right? Because indeed, there's just nothing that the feedback goes on, which might be Yeah, I think that's well. That's I think that's got to happen, right? Because so think about the current, you know. Think of, right at the beginning. Remember, we 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 I, I talked about the um, the gas content is going down all the time, right? It's very very high at high redshift, much lower now. The, 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 that, that gas is spread over a larger volume because, you know, it, not, not just in galaxies, most of the gas is not in galaxies, right? So, um, so you, you um, that means that when, I mean, feedback is, you know, you have an event that happens in the galaxy and it blows the gas out, right, for one way or another. Well, what happens to that gas and what happens, you know, how does it fall back in? Or does it fall back in? So, so I think that the, those sorts of quenching processes have to slow down with redshift. Um, very little, to be perfectly honest. I mean, um, well, there are. We don't. We the properties of dark matter. We don't really learn anything. However, you can make mass models of these galaxies, and you can, and you know, we, we've worked out what the mass to light ratio is. So we get the light, we get the mass to light ratio, we get the mass distribution. These model, these galaxies, we're only looking at the central half of the light, right? So we're in the central part of the potential. And we can say, for example, that on that scale, the um, the dark matter is dynamically not very important. So the, the, the dynamics are pretty self-consistent with maybe 15 to 25% of the mass inside a half mass radius uh, being dark. So not much dark matter in there. So, so two awful answers to your question. One is that we, we nothing about the nature of dark matter and you know, no, dark matter really isn't that important for this story inside the galaxies. Um, so I didn't quite get the first part of what you said. So just just say the first part again. I mean, that matter people sort of invented about some, you know, the knowledge of uh, dark matter and the process really uh, make galaxies, right? And how to make galaxies and whether they fractionalize in a way so that not, that depends also on where that matter is and whether it's causing gravitation or where whether Right. Okay. I, I understand what you're saying now. Yeah. Um, so, so the whole approach is only based on cold dark matter, right? So there, there's no consideration of any interaction between different kinds of dark matter at all, right? So, it, you know, it's a monolithic sort of approach. You take uh, lambda cold dark matter and build from there. So I'm afraid we, we, we really don't, we really can't draw any conclusions about the nature of dark matter from this starting point. You'd have to, you'd have another starting point to do that. Um, so these...
uh, two bit different questions. Some of, many of these galaxies will have disks, right? So, but uh, well, no, no, S zero galaxies are early type galaxies. Early type galaxies can have disks, right? Now, you know, one of the things we have learned is that um, things that were classified as um, elliptical galaxies, right, in 20 years ago, uh, we found through making maps with the IFU, so that, like the one I used as an illustration, uh, a, a reasonably large fraction of them, 80% of them, uh, have disks, right? Now, they don't have, they don't have flat disks like, you know, the Milky Way, they, they have puffed up disks, so they have warm disks, not really hot, but warm disks. So, but they, they are quiescent, so they don't have a lot of star formation. They don't, you know, there's no evidence of star formation, particularly. So um, what was, what's the criteria used to select the um, quiescent sample from the SAMI data? It's, uh, I, I'll have to look it up. I've forgotten that exact criteria, I and mean, it's worth getting it right. So we'll just look at it later if we can, yeah. Um, not really, not the dry, not dry mergers because dry mergers wouldn't have any effect on the star formation, right? Yeah, but it um, could do. It depends. It depends. It, you're, you're talking about a major merger now, right? Yeah. So, so th that 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 could happen. Yes. I mean, the role of major mergers at low redshift is generally speaking pretty minor, right? I mean. Got, so I, I kind of covered to Redshift 2 where it's not minor, but if you're just looking at the legacy results from Redshift 0 0.7, there are not a large number of, of major mergers in, in amongst massive galaxies. They're already massive. So they, 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 they are largely at the stage of accreting satellites rather than undergoing major mergers. So from Redshift 2, the number of mer major mergers might be 1, 2, 3, as I said, but from Redshift 0.7, it's, it's a much smaller number. So it's probably not that important. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it so so it does depend a little bit um, on obviously exactly what size the galaxy is and what mass the galaxy has and how much you change everything. But um, in order to bring the tilt, um, I mean the problem with the tilt really is in the size, right? So the dark matter would have to cause the size, you'd have to have the dark matter cause the size to shrink right, a bit. And, and so uh, that's not a trivial thing to get right when you've got to take account of the velocity dispersion of the stars as well. So I can't give you a straight answer to your question. I don't, I don't know the answer because it, it requires two things to change. Uh, and and um, th there are therefore going to be lots of different ways of achieving, I think. So, so that, that's going to be a problem. I must admit, I did think of exactly that question when I was putting this talk together. But <laughs> yeah. Can we constrain the 
So I, I, I yeah. So yep. So the the nature of the Dharma would that change the nature of the? Could you? So the question is, could you use the the measurement of those parameters to make inferences about the nature of the dark matter? Right. Yes. Yes, I think that's true. Uh, I, I, so, I think you could probably figure out how the star formation rate would change when you change the dark matter, the nature of the dark matter. But whether you could really bolt down whether uh, whether you can use these type of measurements to to make um, significant inferences, I don't know. I'm, I'm a little skeptical about that because th there are you know there are still quite a lot of caveats here. And you, you know, so uh, we were talking about this earlier. You know, if you're going to make an exceptional claim that dark matter is not you know, the universe isn't a, not a lambda CDM universe, then you've got to have exceptional data. And, you know, you can see there's quite a lot of wiggle room in some of these things. These are scaling arguments largely. So um, I think you could, you could propose such a thing, but whether you could actually implement and learn something, uh, I'm not sure. Searching profiles. Yes, yes. Uh, are, uh, are phenomenological. Though. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, could we understand why this index M is four, quite a few times, and different in another time? No, we don't. No, this it's simply a, an empirical because description of the luminosity profile, yes. which allows us to. Actually, you can estimate the mass, for example, just use, using that if you... Um, it's fine to, 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 it's fine to, to uh, infer mass. Yeah. So I was wondering if from dynamics we understand. No, no, no not, it, it's not really understood why, yeah. wh why you end up with that particular distribution. The, what, the, so, okay, before I finally knock that on the head, uh, there is a paper by Ken Freeman, uh, about the exponential disk in spirals. And I think there is a kind of statistical mechanical argument why, why you get an exponential disk in spiral. So I'm now slightly retracting what I said. The same is not true for, for, the, for the more peaky distributions, but we could look at the paper by Ken. It's just in the 1960s. I think. 